Michigan State's College of Human Medicine provides an innovative, patient-centered curriculum with multiple specialties and multiple opportunities for clinical exposure. Does this sound appealing? Plug in your earbuds, because today I'm speaking with the Assistant Dean of Admissions at Michigan State University's College of Human Medicine. Welcome to Admission Straight Talk, the podcast dedicated to graduate admissions and helping you approach the application process thoughtfully and successfully. Your host is Accepted's founder and world-renowned admissions guru, Linda Abraham. At Accepted, our mission is to get you to that unforgettable moment when you read your acceptance email and shout, yes, I'm in, confident you'll be attending the perfect program to help you launch the career of your dreams. Welcome to the 522nd episode of Admission Straight Talk. Thanks for tuning in. Are you ready to apply to your dream medical schools? Are you competitive at your target programs? Accepted's Med School Admissions Quiz can give you a quick reality check. Just go to accepted.com slash med quiz, complete the quiz. You'll not only get an assessment, but tips on how to improve your chances of acceptance. Plus, it's all free. Again, use the calculator at accepted.com slash med quiz to obtain your free assessment. Our guest today is Dr. Joel Maurer, Assistant Dean of Admissions at Michigan State University's College of Human Medicine and an Associate Professor of Obstetrics, Gynecology, and Reproductive Biology at MSU CHM, or College of Human Medicine. Dr. Maurer, welcome to Admission Straight Talk. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. I'm delighted to speak with you today. Now, to start, can you give an overview of MSU's MD program, focusing on its more distinctive elements, and specifically the shared discovery curriculum? Sure. There's a there's a lot going on there, um, and I'll do my best to sort of give you a quick overview. College of Human Medicine is an allopathic medical school, so it grants the MD degree. It was founded in the mid-60s as a response from the people of the state of Michigan to create a brand new medical school that would initially have its primary focus on primary care physician development. The needs of the state at that time were very much in the line of primary care, frontline care. As the college grew and matured, um, the needs of the state became more encompassing. And so it is a medical school that, although primary care remains a, a critical component of what they hope to make contributions to, it's a school that appreciates the need of um physicians uh, across the wide spectrum of healthcare. The other thing of note, uh, historically, it was the very first four-year MD granting medical school that used the community-based model as its uh, foundation. And so uh, Michigan State has always had a long history of sort of looking at pedagogical approaches and teaching and how to teach people to teach others. Um, And at that time, they had an opportunity to create a medical school that kind of looked at how everyone else was doing it and trying to figure out, is there a way that we can do it differently and maybe better? One of the key tenets is that it always wanted its students to learn medicine out on the front line where it was happening. And so um, in order to do that, they decided that maybe it was best in those formative clinical years, years three and four, to put its students more out on the front line all across the state of Michigan in order to see medicine happening as symptoms were coming forth and not a pre-existing diagnosis. And so it's been a medical school that felt that it was always important to have uh, strategic community partners spread throughout the state such that the first two years of medical school could be conducted on Michigan State home campus. But then years three and four, let's have our students learn in our existing community. So as such, we've never had our own um, tertiary-based hospital. We've never uh, had the Michigan State University hospitals and clinics. Um, Mm -hmm. It's always been a, a school that that wanted to create strategic relationships with the people and the communities across the state of Michigan. So, so that's sort of been its foundational format. You know, the thing I think that are, that's sort of interesting or moving on a little bit to what we call our shared discovery curriculum that came about as again, Michigan state always kind of looks at how are they doing things? How can we do them better? Maybe differently in a way that others aren't doing it. And it came up, Um, with an idea based in the education literature of how could we reorganize our curriculum, particularly as it relates to years one and two, 
in such a way that it helps our students start to think about um, think and think like a doctor starting on day one and less so waiting until year three. And so um, in doing a, a bunch of research on how young adult learners learn best, those behind the development of this curriculum said, well, what if we were to present a curriculum that's actually based on patient symptoms? Again, sort of harkening back to the foundations of our medical school, let's put our students out on the front line where symptoms are happening and not necessarily a diagnosis. How, can, can we do that at the same um, for the same thing starting in year one and two? And so what our curriculum developers did is they they tried to figure out, or they looked at like the top 100 or so reasons why patients seek healthcare. And what they decided is that, well, is there a way that we can use these top reasons to form a week's worth or a couple weeks worth of curriculum? So for example, maybe in the first year, the student will have a week that's called fever, okay? So we're going to learn the anatomy behind fever. We're going to learn the physiology, the cell biology, initiate some of the disease pathology, the immunology, how vaccines are involved in all of that. And we present it with more of a clinical lens so that when a student hears fever, they're starting to think about all of those things as maybe you might as a physician out in the real world, you may not have a diagnosis, but you st we're going to start to get them to think about right. you know, the basic sciences and the disease sciences and the social sciences and humanities behind fever and, and build upon that. So, so that's sort of, sort of the interesting, unique thing about our shared discovery curriculum. It's, it's not systems-based. It's not. Um, yeah. yeah. You know, it's not, it sort of, it breaks down the traditional ivory towers. So, so, um, you know, there is not anatomy class. There is not physiology class. It's all blended together. And each semester is one giant 16 credit course. Hmm. Okay. So that's sort of the unique thing about that. Um, you know, I would say the other thing that's an interesting element or a distinctive element about our curriculum is that its assessments are based on progress testing. I think medical schools have a history of using more traditional assessment models where every month you're going to have a high stakes exam and you have to be able to pick the right answer at, at a high enough level to pass. Back what you learned, right? Exactly. That's not how it works at the College of Human Medicine. Every semester, every, regardless if you are a first year, first semester student or an out the door, second semester, fourth year student, everybody sits down and takes the same exam. Well, it's not quite that. So first and second year students will take a standardized exam that is representative of the step one licensing exam. Okay. Years three and four, they will take an exam that is representative of their step two licensing exam. Okay, so there are some subtle differences, but say, if, you know, if you're a first semester, first year student, you're going to sit down and you're going to take a standardized exam that covers all the material that is in, you know, in theory testable on a step one licensing exam. And students who are used to being test crushers now find that they scored a 40 on the, on an exam and but they haven't been they haven't been educated on all the topics, right? Right, right, right. So so they score 40 on that initial exam and they that's some culture shock to them. Whereas the rest of us behind the scenes are going, Ooh, all right, you only got another 40 or 50 points to go. So you're already 40 points there. So good job, you know. But that takes some adjustment. Um, and, and the thing about what progress testing does is that it eliminates the binge learning. You know, traditional assessment strategies, students cram. They cram and cram and cram. They take their exam. They're exhausted. They go party afterwards. They forget it until they have to relearn it again, okay? In a progress testing environment, there is no cramming. You, you can't cram for these exams. You have to develop learning strategies that promotes retention and long-term learning in order to continue to build on 
what we're trying to do in the first two years and then and, and beyond. So, so that's sort of, uh, there's a lot going on there. Um, yeah. Answering that, that first question, but I think there's so many things that are kind of unique about us from a pedagogical lens that I think that it was worth spending just a few moments highlighting a couple of No, I appreciate it. I also appreciate it because you gave the, the reasoning behind it as well as example. So that that was a great answer. Thank you very much. Now you mentioned the community-based medicine and how important that is to MSU. And there are seven regional campuses and like, are they offering? Now eight. Oh, now eight. Okay. Yep, All right. We added we we recently added a second campus in the southeast Michigan in the Detroit area. So we now okay. have two Detroit-based campuses. So apparently I missed I missed that part because I, I was uh, okay. it before. But does that mean that students pick a, a regional campus and they focus on that one, or do they hop around from different campuses to have different experiences, or is it, does it depend on the students' preferences? Yeah, I mean, in the end, it's it's assigned as a home base campus for them. Okay. okay. So in the sec in the second year of medical school, for the majority of our students, they have an opportunity to sort of vet all these different campuses and what are their strengths, what are their environments like, what's the learning environment like. And they go through a process that ultimately it's the college's responsibility to assign them to a campus, okay. but we do we bend over backwards to try to listen to the student. What are their preferences? Give them opportunities to end up hopefully in that first choice campus where they hope to be. But the idea is that in year three and four, say you get assigned to the Flint campus. Mm-hmm. The idea is that you will spend, you will consider Flint as your home base campus for the next two years. If there are clinical experiences as a student that you want that Flint isn't the best place to achieve them, we do create opportunities within our multi-campus system for students to get those experiences. But the thing that's common and that we have to be able to demonstrate to maintain our accreditation is that regardless of whether or not you are at, uh, doing year three and four in Lansing or Marquette or Midland or Detroit, there is a baseline curriculum that each one of those campuses have to meet in order to assure a standardization of educational experience for all students, regardless of what campus they're assigned. Great. Got it. Thank you. Now let's turn to the application since the people we're addressing here really are applicants. I I do think it's important that they know what's special about the school before they apply. So again, I really appreciate your going into that, but does in terms of obviously they, they provide a primary application. Does MSU screen before sending out secondaries? We actually don't. Um, So it's automatic. It it is automatic. And Mm -hmm. our logic behind it is that we believe that the common application doesn't allow a student to tell us their whole story. And, and, And we're a school that really takes the mission of our college really seriously. It's a mission that focuses on promoting dignity and respect of all people and responding to the needs of the medically underserved. And I think that we can get some some insights to that on a common application, um, but the secondary application really helps us look for those applicants in which we feel that our mission and their values are a good alignment with each other in a way um, that screening on the front end probably doesn't help us out. So. Okay. Now, when you're looking for that alignment, are you looking for, I mean, Michigan State is obviously a public institution. Are you looking for ties to Michigan? Are you looking for, you know, experiences on serving the underserved or working in different communities or? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, as a state supported medical school, so much of our educational funding does come from uh, public resources. And so um, we do give significant preference to um, applicants who are from the state of Michigan. In any given year, that number will run anywhere from 80 to 85 percent of our income. Yeah, that's, and that's for a class of like 190 every year. Having said, um, I would say that my experience for our out-of-state applicants is that ties to the state of Michigan may not really be as important. I think our mission, that piece in which the walk and the talk and the application is consistent with um, a desire to serve um, underserved communities, uh, address significant healthcare disparities in our society, really is the piece that 
that sets that applicant pool apart. And, and the truth of the matter, it, that's an important piece for our in-state applicant pool as well. There's lots of applicants from the state of Michigan who are excellent looking future physicians on paper, but if we don't feel like we've got a connection with them and particularly with our mission, um, it's an application that probably isn't gonna go very far. So, so we really take that mission seriously. Got it. Now, MSU had last year five very interesting, thought-provoking questions in its secondary. Okay. Um, uh, I like them. Are you planning to keep the same questions this year? Yeah, that's a good question. I think that there will be probably not a lot of changes. I think one of the th things um, that we might consider, we do have a question that is directly related to our recent pandemic. I think that um, in talking with our admissions committee, I think it's possible that that one might become an optional question as right. opposed to one that we want everyone to answer. This much I will say. In reviewing with the committee, there's one that asks applicants to think about 10 personal characteristics and then talk about three of them. Right. Um, for, it's interesting. I think for most of our committee, they felt that that one wasn't as helpful as the other ones. And so it is possible we will either drop that or replace it with a different one or maybe modify one of them so that it gets down to three questions plus one optional. I think in a perfect world, I'd like to see it go that way just because I know we ask so much of our applicants to share and jump hoops and that sort of thing. I think anytime that we have an opportunity to make our secondary application more efficient, we will. Um, but short of that, I don't think the questions are gonna change significantly um, this year. So if any of you out there wanna take a look at it and start <laughs> practicing some responses, some written responses, um, I'd say go ahead and go for it, so. We'll, we'll actually have links in the show notes to them. And so oh, great. Listeners can, yeah, listeners can access the link at accepted.com slash 522. But getting back to the application, are you concerned at all about the impact of chat GPT on the essay component of the application? And yeah, <laughs> yeah, you know, I am, I, you know, I, um, everybody is, I mean, I, I yeah. for them and everybody, I don't mean that like all inclusively, but I do think that the vast majority of us who are in admissions are really concerned about that. And, and how are we going to, address that down the road. I think in the short term, we don't have a lot of quick answers. I think some of us are likely going to have our applicants on an honor code system, at least check off uh, an attestation statement that says that the content and the writing of a written response to anything within our application, whether or not it's the secondary or part of the common application, that these are your own words and that they were not created by someone else or another entity. I don't know that universally we've got the bandwidth to enforce that or to follow up on that. But, you know, this is an issue of professionalism. Becoming a future healthcare provider is a professional career expect certain behaviors um, from those who ultimately want to go out and serve and care for others. And so I would say in the short term, I don't think we have a, um, a good solution or a good way to address it. I know that there are some that are leaning towards the possibility of abandoning a written response secondary and have it be a video response secondary. You know, I don't think that that still is the the solution to a, a chat to GPT, mainly because we all know that our questions do get out there. They get disseminated whether or not we have, you know, whether or not we want them or not, they're going to get out there. And so I think the the difference is can somebody, if they're using chat GPT in a video-based response to a secondary, can they pull it off? with the camera on right, without right, people being right. suspicious that they have either rehearsed and memorized that answer or that their eyes are moving and gazing to a written right, response right. they're reading back to us. So I think it would, I, I suspect it may move in that direction. And I think it would be 
unwise of applicants to apply those sorts of methodologies to try to game quote this this piece of the application so i think i like almost every person on the planet has has played with it a little bit and i took um an mba essay question and you know threw some information in and saw what came up it was it was um not terribly impressive now if not i had interesting yeah it was it was very superficial cliche filled banal and what would have been interesting and i didn't do this but if if i had provided more substance could it have put together a, you know an essay i didn't i didn't try that yeah. but the the first the first attempt was nothing that would scare me <laughs> okay because okay. it was it was extremely superficial yeah. It would not have impressed any admissions committee member that I've talked to. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I think it, you touch on something that's kind of interesting and important because I think the, the the piece that also that we worry about in the admissions world is that those applicants who come from resource rich backgrounds will likely, if they use Chat GPT, will likely be able to pull it off. And those who come from resource stressed backgrounds may not have the the mentoring and the and the resources themselves. And if they try to do it like you just said that yeah. you did with just a little bit of information, it will be a relatively unimpressive response. And so, you know, I I think we worry that it'll. It, it yet again, it, it will be an example in which it will create an inequity within our applicant pool, particularly for schools like ours that, um, and we didn't touch on this, but, you know, with regards to our, our admissions diversity statement, we do give some preference to applicants who come from disadvantaged backgrounds in our process. And so we worry that, you know, again, this will be a, a tool and an instrument in which those who have a lot of resources will be able to use it and use it effectively and be able to use it in a way that is believable and those who are less resource um mm -hmm. blessed will will if they choose to use it it may not have it may not help them right yeah it's a valid concern valid concern yeah now moving on to the application process which to a different element of it what is the role of the situational judgment test whether it's the casper or preview Oh, you didn't like that question <laughs> oh, <laughs> in your, in your evaluation process. <laughs> oh, you know, it's challenging. You know, a few years ago, we started requiring Casper, um, mainly because we felt that there was some validity to the results, at least on the front end. Uh, you know, I think we still struggle to figure out and understand, is there long-term predictive results from right. situational judgment tests? And so... We initiated it using it mainly on the front end, just to try to see, um, would this help us if we've got, you know, 9,000 applicants and we can get it narrowed down to 3,000 for 550 interviews, could Casper help us figure out which of those five, which of those 3,000 to bring in for those interviews? You know, I think for us, it's been hard, I think, to use it in that capacity. I think it's helpful on some on the screening side. Our committee has been really reluctant to um, look at it super closely. Again, for those same reasons, you know, what data do we have that that shows that someone who does well on a situational judgment test stays out of you know, professionalism problems with state licensing boards down the road and, and that sort of thing, or advances through a four-year curriculum on time, or that they don't have professionalism issues in medical school. I think we're we're still struggling to try to find that answer. I think the other thing why I sort of uh, am, am sort of internally tormented by it is that this year, there's also a second one. Um, well, the double ANC. Yep. So right. it's called preview. Yeah. And this year, we're the only medical school, to the best of my knowledge, that it, if we were going to require an SJT, we allowed either or. That's right. Okay. Um, and the reason being is that I didn't, um, I, again, it's an equity issue. If I'm going to take the heat for requiring a student to take an, another exam and pay $100 to do it, I certainly don't want to be the one that says, well, you only can take Casper. 
Okay, when I know I've got a colleague down the road or you know in another state that says, well, we're only a preview school. And so if you wanna to apply to us, you gotta take it too. And so I just, I wasn't gonna play that game. And, and I told both parties, I said, if I'm going to stick with a, if I'm going to continue to use SJT, right. I'm not going to, I'm not going to dictate which one to take. Now, here, the, the thing that we're going to be looking at this year, and in fact, I just got my IRB approval today, which I'm really excited about. We're going to look internally at our applicant pool with regards to Casper, if they took Casper only, if they took preview only, and if they took both. And because I think the thing that I'm starting to see a little bit anecdotally is that I'm not seeing a lot. If they took both, I'm not always seeing a consistent correlation of the results. And that bothers me. And that concerns right. me because if you do bad on one, but well on the other, what does that mean? They're measuring I, different I things. Well, well, exactly. And I think both parties would say they're measuring different things. But the problem is, is people are using this for in the mindset of, well, isn't it supposed to give me some sort of um, baseline understanding of the of the professionalism and the character right. that already exists right. that we would want in a future, in, at right. least in a medical student, a future care provider. And so the fact that I'm sort of starting to see some, some inconsistencies with these two tests, it just, it really bothers me that we now have a system in which if someone does poorly on one, what does that really mean? It may not mean anything. I think we think that if they do, if they take both and they do well on both, it probably means something. If they take both and they bomb both of them, it probably means something. But I'm I'm kind of seeing enough of some discordance between the two that it makes me really uncomfortable, maybe about using SJT down the road. And so you know, right now we're still going to require it for this upcoming cycle, but I would say stay tuned. Okay. All right. That was a fascinating answer. I interviewed Dr. Kelly Dore from Casper a few weeks ago, and it was, it was a, just a fascinating interview. The whole subject is fascinating. Okay. Now I, I know nothing about creating valid tests. <laughs> let's, let's understand that. I don't to either. Start with. Okay. Yeah. I know nothing. I mean, I understand the concept of you want to see if the test is predictive of good judgment. You want to see if it's predictive of professionalism or the ability to be a good doctor, but I don't think the test has been devised yet that really can predict who's going to be a good doctor. No, it doesn't. And, and, you know, and like all standardized tests, they all have the same problems, you know, inherently people who come from marginalized and disadvantaged backgrounds tend not to do as well on standardized tests. And the same data comes forth in situational judgment. There are some small cohorts within those communities that do better um, based on really strict criteria. But what I'm discovering is that, it, yet again, it's a standardized test in which those who are resource blessed do have a better chance of doing well than those who aren't. So right. it really bothers me. Right, right. No, understandably. It's also, I mean, one thing I've I asked her about it at the interview, and I'm still kind of questioning in my own mind is how can you objectively measure something that's as subjective as judgment? But that's that's a different that's a whole different subject. And yeah. uh you yeah. know, again, I, yeah. Uh, and I don't pretend to have a great answer for that either. But you know, I I, I will say in defense of both of these, I mean, these yeah. these two instruments have been at least um, extensively studied with regards to internal consistency on how they're scored. And so, so however they are training their scorers from one person to the next to the next and the next, there's at least a level of validity in the exam in, in how it's being scored. Right. I think in the end, the question is, how well is it giving its information that's going to be predictive of, a, of an outcome down the road that is meaningful? So. Right. Hey, great answer. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, that was that was, it was a really interesting interview with her. But anyways, that's a separate separate question. What is the common mistake that you see applicants make in either the primary or secondary? Oh, I'm not asking you happy too, questions, huh? <laughs> no, like too many, too many to no. I shouldn't say it like that. But there, but there are some common mistakes. Um, some to, like so, for example, for reapplicants. Yeah. Okay. I think one of the common mistakes that they'll make is recycling a personal statement. 
I'm so glad you said that. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, here's the thing. Who knows that that personal statement was the thing, you know, contributed to a, the mm-hmm. outcome or not. Mm-hmm. But I think, you know, in the end, whatever you wrote last time didn't make a threshold for people to, you know, want to look at look Jenny more closely. So, if you know, if you're a reapplicant. I would really rethink about how you write that personal statement. I think the topics and could are are fair for you to not change around. I mean, if these are if these are sentimental life experiences you've, that you've had, you don't want to necessarily change the what the content, but I think that you might want to relook at how you put it together so that at least a reader doesn't go back and check last year or the application two years ago and say, uh. Oh, they just recycled this. That means because what that does is it says a me- it sent, it does kind of send a message that you're just going through recycling. the motions. Yeah, you're recycling. And then granted, I under I get it. I understand. There's a lot that you got to do to put together a application portfolio. But I would probably err on the side of not recycling an application. I just think it gives an impression and a vibe to the reader that makes you vulnerable. So I think that's kind of a, a big piece. Here's the other thing I would say for with regards to reapplicants. I think one of the biggest mistakes reapplicants make is they don't solicit feedback. Okay. Now, having said, um, I understand that many in my medical school admissions community don't provide a feedback service to unsuccessful applicants. Doesn't mean that you shouldn't ask, though. Okay. Because some of us do, like College of Human Medicine admissions, um, we will. Uh, upon request, offer uh, a consultative appointment with an unsuccessful applicant. Um, And it's done in such a way that we try to help them lead, find the answers themselves. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mm -hmm. less so about You don't say you got rejected because of this, but you might ask questions. We ask questions in in a way and and create a, a document or help them create a document that helps them reflect upon their application. Okay. And, you know, it depends on how far they get through the cycle. So if someone gives a written application, they don't get an interview. So, you know, we help them go through that to help maybe help identify areas that need further development. If they get an interview and they don't get in, so that can be a little more challenging as well, because, well, here's what I usually tell these applicants. You get an interview, you're close then. Yeah. You're about I assume about half your interviewees get offers, right? I'm just guessing Probably, the numbers yeah. I saw. Yeah, about half and maybe even a little more than half by the okay. time August rolls around. And so it's not uncommon for us in the end to have about, you know, if we do 540 or so interviews a year, you know, about 330 will maybe ultimately get an offer. So I mean, the odds are in your favor, at least okay. at our school that um, if, if you get an interview, you're at least close. And so, you know, and but, you know, at the end, the committee looks at everything. They look at the written application. They look at the interviews that you've had and things that we're measuring in the interview. And, and sometimes in the end, it's a little bit of all three of those or all of those things. And so trying to help a, an applicant better understand the areas that didn't come forth as strong um, in the eyes of the committee can be a little challenging without actually spoon feeding them too. So, but we try hard to not um, give, you know, that kind of information because there is some, um, a need for the committee to be able to make those decisions, some of those really tough decisions without necessarily protecting the way in which they make those decisions. Um, Mm -hmm. So, Anyway, thank you again. Great answers. And just going back to the personal statement comment about okay. for, for reapplicants, the other thing I think that's that's bad about just recycling a personal statement is it it prohibits you from showing growth during the preceding year. Yeah, totally. Totally. Well, and it sends <laughs> it, it sends, sends a message. Absolutely sends I yeah, it sends a message. It sends, but I mean it, some, pres- it also sends a message that you're lazy. Yeah, of frankly, course. Of course. You know, so yeah, I mean, I mean, if you don't get in and you're a reapplicant, that's a you want to you want that application next time around to answer the question, well, what is different about me this time? And if you don't I, new and improved. Right. And if you don't take the time to to really point that out, then it you increase the chance that it'll get overlooked. 
So right. I would say anything, you know, one of the questions, I will tell you this much, and this is jumping to our secondary, one of the right. questions that has not changed in eons with us is, is there anything more you want the committee to know? Okay. I mean, I think anytime an applicant sees that question asked of them, a couple things, one, that they, the light bulb should go off. One is, this is an opportunity for me to highlight what's different about me. Okay. And the if they haven't that, talked about elsewhere. Are they, that they haven't, haven't talked about elsewhere, or if they have, make sure, you, I really want to emphasize this. Okay. Okay. And go and into I more think, depth. Right. Go into go into a little bit more depth or, you know, at least make sure you've highlighted and say, I know I talked about this in my um, in my personal statement, but I really want to hit the drive home that this is what, how I'm a different applicant this time around. I think the other thing that that question lends itself to is, yeah, I tell I tell pre-meds all all around the, the state and around uh, the country admissions committees, they're like cats and dogs. They like to be petted. They like to be stroked. They like to be told, why is it that you love me? Okay. <laughs> and so if you have a question like that, or I would say even anywhere in the secondary, one of the things that you absolutely have to do, and, and this gets back to what are some of the mistakes that maybe people make universally. So they, they don't take the time to share with um, an admissions office and the committee, why us? Okay, why are you applying to it? I mean, you know, I think that there's too much advising out there that looks at some, that it's based on someone's academic metrics. And they say, well, you're competitive, but you know, there's a lot of better competitive applicants, unfortunately, because of your grades and your MCAT. And as such, you're gonna have to cast a really huge net. Okay, I think that's really bad advice. I think what, what needs to happen is a student, a pre-med applicant needs to look at the package that they have, the portfolio they have, what is important to you, what are you trying to accomplish in your career, find those medical schools out there that you think have that similar value system, and you apply, instead of, a, instead of applying to 50, you apply to 20, or 50, you know, between 15 and 20, and you say, I specifically applied to the College of Human Medicine because of these two reasons. OK, it's it sends a message to the committee that you've at least done your homework on us. And based on your life experiences that you've shared with us, I can see why it is that you're you're interested in us. And I think that's a big mistake that applicants don't do. They don't take the time to share why is it that I specifically applied to Northwestern or Washington yeah. and St. Louis yeah. or University of Iowa. They they don't take the time to do that. And I think that's a mistake. Great. Thank you so much. That was that was wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, it's true. I mean, that, that's yeah, I know. It was a great, great answer. And um, you know, it'll it's every so often we'll talk to an applicant. I applied to 40 schools, I applied to 50 schools, I applied to 60 schools, and, and oh, you gotta be crazy. Um <laughs> it's yeah. But any no, and, and, well, I mean, here's my take. If you're, if it's you're like not throwing, you know, darts at a dartboard. Well, right, right. So there's a side of me that sort of says, if you if you apply to 20 medical schools and you don't get in, the likelihood that you would have gotten a bite from someone who by by applying to 40 or 60, I think is pretty small. And so if you if you've done your homework and you've selected these are the 20 schools that I think I have the best chance of getting in and you don't, then that, that tells me that there's something going on in that written application. Or if you did get an in interview, something that happened in the interview or that in the, the context of right. all of that together. Mm -hmm. And so I just think, I, I just think this idea of casting a huge net is not um, the best way to approach this. I think I think students, uh, pre-med students would be much better off doing their homework leading up to an application cycle. Which are the 20 schools that I think I have a competing chance with and that I have something in common with? And if you tell us that, I bet you might get an interview more, a few more interviews than, than what you might have otherwise. Great advice. Thank you so much. Yeah. Speaking of the interviews, will mm -hmm. your interviews be online next year? Do you know, yes. or will they, they'll be virtual? 
they will okay. stay online. They will stay. Um, yes. Yeah. And, okay. and, and they will stay that way until someone, either someone above me tells me otherwise, or I come to a different conclusion. But for us, it's all about an equity issue. So um, we understand that in pre-pandemic, when we had people travel to East Lansing and Grand Rapids for their interviews, that's an expense. And that's an expense that not everyone can um, can prepare for. And I under also understand having technological equipment may also be an obstacle for some, but it's an easier piece to, I think, to solve than where am I going to come up with $1,000 to fly to East Lansing, Michigan and have two nights in a hotel on a rental car. So right. no, makes sense. Makes sense. For us, that's it is. Yeah. Yeah. Are you going to make any changes to the format? I know it's a mixture of traditional one-on-one -on -one with MMI. Is yeah, we don't, an, right now we don't anticipate uh, making any changes to that framework. It'll still be um, a 30 minute or so interview with a current medical student one-on-one -on -one, and then an eight station MMI. What makes a great interview? I just think people, if someone is themselves and, they're, and genuine, then it's an easy process for people. Mm -hmm. I think when people try to be something that they're not, I think that makes it hard, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I will tell you for us, we're not trying to trip anybody up in any of our interviews. And I'm not saying that we're looking for extroverts and people that can have a, you know, a, 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 an outgoing conversation with, with people, whether or not it's 30 over 30 minutes or over eight minutes. But I think, can you, can you develop a rapport with, with someone? Um, and can you, can you respond in a way that genuinely reflects the lens in which you view the world around you? And I think, I think that's what really makes a great interview. Right. Wonderful. Thank you. Here's a, a question. I, I'll tell you why I ask it because some people look at me like I'm weird when I ask it, but I'm going to ask it anyway. When does MSU typically stop sending out interview invitations? Yeah. Uh, great question. Um, we tend to interview well into February, actually. Okay. okay. Um, on occasion, we will have a few March dates, but we we do try hard to try to wrap up the general interview season in February. So I would say if the last week of February is rolled around and you've not heard from us, you're probably not going to get an interview. But eventually, we do. I will say this much: we do give everyone the courtesy of a formal notification that. If you did not get an interview, um, your application with us has has ended. Okay, well, that's I'm sure appreciated by the applicants. Yeah, it's you know not knowing is worse than than a no. <laughs> well, it is, and we try not to like we we try to let kind of people know as those decisions are mm -hmm. made. So like we'll have applicants that'll apply early, and um, uh, the one thing that I I. I do tell people is that we will not give anyone formal notification of a of a term uh, of the end of an application at least until mid October. Oh, okay. okay. Well, that's, that's so that decision early. might yeah. be made before then, but but from a standardization lens, people will not hear any earlier than mid October. Got it. Okay. How do you view prerequisites if they're taking at a community college? Is that like oh. a negative? No, in fact, that, no, we look, we actually, we actually look positively um, on that, not for the reason maybe why you're asking though, but, you know, I think I would say from a, you know, from the lens of higher ed, I mean, everyone's got a different journey. Yeah. Um, has a different pathway to an end point. And for some, that means going, starting off at a two-year degree granting institution. And there's lots of reasons why that happens. And I think if we're going to respect the ideology of higher ed and a course of introductory biology at a community college versus one from a four-year institution, I think that there's, I think we need to look at that as being valid. Now, in the end, there is also a standardized test that pretty much everyone is making people take. But I will say this much, if someone applies to us and they they've had a circuitous pathway to a, a, a final degree and it's taken them seven years to get there because they did you know three years of community college while working full time and then you know another three years uh, of a four at a four-year 
granting institution because they had to work part time in order to get through that. And they have an MCAT score that indicates that they should be successful, you know, then we're cool with it. We okay. like it. And yeah, I mean, I mean, and again, and I think it kind of falls within our mission. We, you know, we understand that people that come from disadvantaged backgrounds are more likely than others to return to those communities in which they grew up and and had disadvantaged commonality. And those are often healthcare resource challenged communities. And so, so, you know, some of our institutional relationships within the state of Michigan actually are formally with community colleges. So, so we look very, uh, we, we don't. You're fine with it. Yeah. Got it. How do you view shadowing and virtual sh shadowing? You know, I mean, I, I don't think that they're the same necessarily, but obviously in this most recent pandemic, people had to resort to doing very creative things. I'm hopeful that we're starting to move out of a pandemic, you know, society to one that's at least under control endemically. Right. Um, and so I'm hopeful that future applicants um, resort, I don't say resort back, but at least return to an idea and a mindset that an actual in-person um, live experience is probably more insightful than one that is captured on a two-dimensional video screen because because with sh with shadowing yeah you're you're hanging out with with a, a healthcare provider but you're also given the opportunity to look around you you know uh look at you know waiting rooms look at the staff what are the roles that they play you're not going to see that from a virtual shadowing experience. And so I guess I would also be remiss if I didn't say shadowing is just one, one way in which you can get clinical experience. And I think there are a lot of other ways in which you can get meaningful clinical experiences. But do I think that the two of them are the same? I don't. I think, I think if your last resort is still shadowing, do it. But I, I think you're going to, at least from this point moving forward, I think you're going to have a hard time convincing an admissions committee that you've had the the kind of meaningful clinical experiences if they were all done online. So do you do you like I've talked to some admissions uh, professionals, uh, committee members, and they basically say, you know, shadowing is really something I want to see in an applicant an application. And other other admissions committee members say, you know, I'd much rather see you doing something as opposed to just watching. It's passive. Where yeah. do you stand on that? Well, I think I mean we look we like both. Okay. <laughs> we like both. Having said, I mean, I think that there is sort of a sense that shadowing tends to be more often than not opportunities that are offered to people that have connections. Mm -hmm. You know, it's become much more challenging and hard for people, even with connections, to get shadowing experiences, mainly because of uh, HIPAA mm -hmm. um, and some of the hoops that people that aren't employed in an office or a healthcare environment have to sort of negotiate with regards to those regulations. I think more often than not, um, our committee, I would say, tends to really appreciate more hands-on sort of things. So things like nurses' aides, EMT, volunteering in a emergency room. Um, Scribing? I love, when I see someone who's got scribing, I mean, that tells me that not only do they have a good feel for what's going on in a doctor-patient engagement, but if you can do that and get paid to do it at the same time, why wouldn't you do that? I mean, <laughs> you know, I understand there's this sense of volunteering and giving and that sort of thing, but I, can, I think our take on it is where we really see value in volunteering is, are you willing to volunteer in a non-clinical environment because that actually tells us something about what might actually be going on in your heart you know anyone can volunteer in a medical well, I want to say anyone but you volunteering in a clinically related environment it's a little self-serving you know because people know that I've got to get the clinical experiences under my belt so I'm going to volunteer doing this and I think I, and and again I don't want to badmouth that by much at all but I think that if all of your volunteering is clinically related and there isn't that same sense of giving in a non-clinical 
related environment, it does sort of give the impression that, well, yeah, they'll volunteer as long as, as, long as it meets their, their long-term goal or long-term need. And so my take on it is I think my committee just would much rather see, do you have enough clinical experiences under your belt to at least re have some sort of reasonable idea of what you're getting yourself into, whether or not it's paid or volunteer. But for that volunteer piece, man, if you if you can show that you volunteered, you know, Habitat for Humanity or at the local soup kitchen or at or at an underserved um, healthcare facility, or you scoop the snow from the next door neighbor who is 80 years old and can't afford to pay someone to do it, you know? I mean, those are the sorts of things that I think really speak loudly about someone's character that committees want to see. Yeah, yeah, good point. Thank you. Yeah. Here's a, a listener question was once sent in to me a few months ago. If you, know, you are, in addition to being an admissions dean, you're also a physician. Um, <laughs> so if you were a pre-med student, traditional or otherwise, planning to apply in 2024, 2025, what is the one thing you would want yourself to be doing to prepare yourself for medical school? What would you tell your younger self today? I think the younger self is just really be sure that this is what you want to do. Okay. Really be sure because... If it's not, it can be a challenge to really find your niche in the healthcare world. And let me, I'll, I'll give you an example. Sure. Because, and this is me sharing a bit of my life. So I went to medical school. I, I got my degree at the University of Nebraska Medical Center back in 1993. I'm not sure that I had really vetted that career well enough beforehand to really have an idea of what I was asking myself to to do and it's not that i i think i necessarily picked the wrong career but um i'm not sure that i had a full appreciation of the life commitment that it takes to be um a healthcare provider in a way that makes an impact in the world around you initially i went into family medicine I thought that that was where I had the best sort of connection and personality fit and that sort of thing. And about a year into my first um, my first year of residency, I started to question my decision. Um, I wasn't happy. Um, there was things that I didn't necessarily make the connection that I'd have to do a lot of this in family medicine when my experience as a med student was I hate doing that stuff. And so... <laughs> And so it was like, why didn't I make that connection? You know, I should have. But I always kind of knew I had a draw to delivering babies and going to the operating room. Um, unfortunately, the experiences that I had as a medical student didn't necessarily reinforce me wanting to pick that career. But it, it took family medicine for me to see people that had chosen those careers that were fulfilled. They were happy. They loved what they were doing. And I went, oh, you mean if I was to be an OBGYN doc, then there's a chance I could be, actually be really happy doing that? You know, I think as a med student, I didn't recognize how much I really had an affinity for that material. And I thought it was really fascinating. But I had some pretty toxic experiences as it related to some of those things. And I just, it just wasn't on my radar. But I tested it out again as a, as a family medicine resident. And so about halfway through my family medicine uh, residency, I made the decision to change specialties. But I, I I talked with my program director and said, I'm not leaving. I'm going to finish this out, which I did. And so in my third year of medical or third year of residency, I reapplied for the match and, and was fortunate enough to rematch into an OBGYN residency. So I graduated from my family medicine program on a Friday night, loaded the car and drove to Columbia, Missouri, where I started my OB, my four-year OBGYN residency. So I mean, I think, you know, part of that talking to your younger self is make sure that this is really the right career mm -hmm. and, and make sure that you pick a specialty or a spe a, a, an area within medicine that you're going to get excited to get up and go to work every day. And that's what that did for me in the end. And that's, those are the lessons that I, I learned is that it, it may be hard to find the right space for you to make a contribution in healthcare, but take the time to do it. Be really thoughtful about it. 
ask yourself why you didn't why are you why are you ruling some things out and other things in and are you doing it for the right reasons so great answer again yeah. thank you yeah. what yeah. would you have liked me to ask you oh are you going to ask me about scotus <laughs> go ahead <laughs> no. oh yeah cuz you covered chat gpt um, which is also a big um, topic in the admissions community. Sure. You know, I, right now the the admissions community is on pins and needles about the anticipated Supreme Court ruling that is going to be released probably late May or sometime in June mm -hmm. that has to do with affirmative action in admissions across the country. And I would say, um, you know, and I'm saying that actually from the lens in which in Michigan, we're a non-affirmative action state. We're one of the nine that are non-affirmative action states. But even then, I think the potential exists that this ruling could even um, delineate and be more specific to what kinds of information are available to admissions, whether or not it's part of a formal process or not, you know, is that information going to be available on the front end and to committees to make decisions? And I think, I think the, um, the admissions communities, not only in medicine, but across the whole gamut of higher education is a bit on pins and needles right now about how this is all going to, all going to play out. I think. Is we, we'll um, be able to collect certain information. You'll be able to, here's the thing. I think you'll be able to collect it. You just won't be able to see it until they matriculate. Right. Or, or, or see it. You won't be able to see it until the committee or the, whatever the process in place offers an acceptance. Mm -hmm. And if, you know, or the opposite, if you offer a rejection, will you be able to see that information then? I, and mm -hmm. I think that that has the, the admissions world really, um, really concerned because I, I do think that there are compelling arguments that justify the value of diversity within a student body that you just can't incorporate in the same level in a curriculum, you know, and, and the values of that, I think, um, are, are so beneficial to society in the long run that, you know, the idea that um, we will no longer be able to see that information and to help um, have that information at least be available to apply context to the story that someone is telling. Now, having said, there's also the side that will be First Amendment free speech rights. And so will a student or an applicant with certain marginalized identities still be able to share it. that. Yeah. Yeah. I am hopeful that that is the case. So, so I think my message to all of you pre-meds out there is pay close attention to this. If, if on a common application, you are allowed to share personal identities as it relates to demographic information, I, I would still encourage you to fill it out. And if you also identify in a community that in which you believe society has discriminated against historically and, and ongoingly, uh, figure out a way to share that okay. if if the SCOTUS decision allows you to do so. I think if you don't, you're making a big mistake. Got it. Thank you. Again, excellent advice. There you go. Dr. Maurer, I think we're almost out of time. Uh, maybe even over time. I want to thank you so much for joining me and sharing your expertise. You've been really generous and, and your answers have been uh, phenomenal. Do, is there a URL that you'd like to share for um, Michigan State University's Human yeah, College of so Medicine? If anybody has questions or wants to learn more about uh, MSU's College of Human Medicine, just go to mdadmissions.msu.edu. All right. Thank you very much. We'll include links in the show notes at except.com slash 522 to MSU's College of Human Medicine, as well as to other resources that may be helpful to listeners. Thank you, listeners, also for joining me. And a quick reminder, don't miss the Med School Admissions Quiz. Find out if you are really ready to apply and competitive at your target schools. Take the free quiz at except.com slash medquiz today. This is Admission Straight Talk, produced by Accepted, and I am Linda Abraham, your host. I'll talk to you again next week. 